Welcome to today's episode of Healthful Women, a podcast designed to explore topics in women's health at all stages of life. I am your host, Dr. Nathan Fox, an OBGYN and maternal fetal medicine specialist practicing in New York City. At Healthful Woman, I speak with leaders in the field to help you learn more about women's health, pregnancy, and wellness. We're here today with Lauren Abrams, who's a certified nurse midwife who's been practicing midwifery since 1993 was the director of midwifery at Mount Sinai for six years before she said, I do not want to be an administrator. I want to be with patients. Lauren, thank you for coming at Healthful Woman. We're so happy to have you here. Oh, it's totally my pleasure, Nadie. Thank you for having me. So just so our listeners understand, who are you? Where are you from? What do you do? What's your story? Well, I was at, I'm from New York originally. I was born on Long Island in Glen Cove. When I was three, my family moved to Hong Kong. And we spent eight years there, which I think probably sparked a an interest in international travel. We moved back when I was 11. I graduated from high school. I went to Amherst College and was an anthropology major, didn't really know what I wanted to do, but became interested in feminism and women's rights. And when I graduated from college, got a job as a counselor in a Planned Parenthood clinic in Washington, D.C. And that's where I learned about midwifery and women's health and decided that I wanted to be a midwife. So you went to nursing school specifically because you wanted to be a midwife as opposed to sort of doing nursing and then deciding afterwards you wanted to do midwifery. Exactly. Exactly. The program that I did is a special three-year program that includes nursing. It's an accelerated nursing program where you do get your RN and then you get a master's in nursing with a specialization in midwifery. Would most people who end up being midwives, do they start out like you did knowing they wanted to do it? Or are most midwives people who were nurses first and then sort of said, oh, I love labor and delivery and I want to transition into midwifery? That's a great question. And it, the answer reflects the history of midwifery in this country, at least the recent history. I would say probably most midwives in our country started out as nurses and then went on to midwifery school. But there is a growing number that did not become nurses first. And there are three, essentially three pathways to become a midwife in this country. One is the nurse, become a nurse first, work as a nurse, and then do a two-year program that gives you a master's and a certificate in, in midwifery. And probably the majority of certified nurse midwives in this country have done it that way. There's also, there are a couple of programs like mine. I went to Yale and then there's one at Columbia where you can combine the nursing and midwifery in a three-year program. There is another path to midwifery where you end up with a degree, you end up as a certified midwife, not a certified nurse midwife. And this is a three-year program that requires a bachelor's in anything pretty much to enter and a lot of prerequisites. When you finish, you take exactly the same qualifying exams as a certified nurse midwife, but you're not a nurse. There's been actually, since these programs started, there's been research done showing there really is no difference in skill and competence between the two two types of midwife. Meaning that for most midwives, they wouldn't need the skills gained specifically in nursing school as opposed to midwifery school. Exactly. And in fact, in most countries, Midwife, midwifery is a separate profession from nursing completely. Oh, interesting. Okay. So meaning mm-hmm. in other countries, they people just go right into midwifery without nursing. Exactly. And how did they get sort of combined in the US? Is that a historical thing or is it yes. always been that way? It is a historical thing. Initially, midwifery in this country, midwives in this country were traditionally trained. They were mostly immigrants and or slaves who came here from other places. Midwives were traditionally trained trained, not formally trained, but had knowledge and skills passed on from other midwives. And midwives attended most of the births in this country until the beginning of the 20th century, maybe, maybe a little bit before that, when obstetricians and doctors realized that they could make a lot of money by attending births and began to medicalize birth and talk about midwives as sort of dirty and unskilled. There was a lot of racism involved in this process as well. Midwives 
of gradually stopped attending births as more births began to happen in hospitals with doctors. Dr. DeLee had a lot to do with this, actually, in the beginning of the 20th century. And then what happened was birth became very medicalized, but then there was a need, there did become a need for midwives because there were more births than obstetricians could handle and also more births in poor areas than obstetricians wanted to handle. And so public health nurses teamed up with obstetricians and started to develop formalized nurse midwifery programs that required nursing skills before before midwifery training. So they sort of like reinvented for worse or for better midwifery into something more formalized. Exactly. Got it. I mean, like what you're saying, when when most births in this country were attended by midwives, I mean, most births in the history of earth were attended by midwives because obstetricians, I mean, we didn't exist before, you know, whatever, a few hundred years ago. There wasn't, there wasn't such thing as an obstetrician. It was all midwives. Exactly. And in most other countries, most other European countries, Asian countries, midwives do at least half the births where here it's maybe eight to 10% of the births in this country are attended by midwives. Right. But I assume that in other countries, one of the things that may be similar is it's probably moved from an apprenticeship type of training to something more formalized in many yes. other countries, even if not in such a maybe nefarious way. It was it's done because that's how everything is, has sort of progressed over time. Absolutely. Absolutely. But these are midwifery programs, not nursing programs. Right. Which makes a lot of sense. And so would you so nowadays uh, in the U.S. at least, how would you say, you know, what is a midwife? What does a midwife do? A quick way to put it is a midwife is an expert in normal pregnancy and birth. So midwives are trained in prenatal care, also in well woman care, annual exams, contraception care, routine GYN care, and in attending uncomplicated births. How would you define an uncomplicated birth? A birth that doesn't require an intervention. Right. Okay. And I mean, I think a lot of people don't realize that what you said other about the well woman care, that many midwives do what we would call like outpatient type of visits. You know, someone yes. has, needs a checkup or they have a specific problem, whether it's related to pregnancy or not, just for gynecology. And they do that. Exactly. Exactly. Or contraception. We insert IUDs, we place contraceptive implants, we can manage basic well woman care. Is the training in the US, I know there's different, you know, sort of paths to it, But would all midwives be trained in all of those different things? All certified nurse midwives and certified midwives, yes. Well, woman care is a part of these formal programs. The third way to become a midwife in this country, there is, there are still what we can, what some people call direct entry midwives who do not complete an accredited education program, but go through more of an apprenticeship. Those midwives tend to focus on pregnancy and birth and don't tend to provide contraceptive or DOIN care. Got it. And then in terms of, I assume, even though uh, what you said, people go through the more traditional training programs are all trained in that, I presume that midwives, what they actually do varies between person to person, geographically, you know, every system and, and whatnot. Yes, exactly. Right. Because I mean, there's some midwives who are like on labor floor the entire time and others who yes. almost never step foot on a labor floor and either yes. have nothing to do with births or whatever. Yes, exactly. Interesting. And and you said that is different from other countries or it's similar to other countries? I believe it's different from other countries. I do believe in most other countries, midwives really do focus on pregnancy and birth. They don't provide as much well woman care or care outside of uh, the reproductive health cycle. And do you think that's related to just sort of how our health system is in general, that, you know, it's because it's not maybe socialized as it is in other countries, and maybe it's more difficult to get these visits through doctors, and so you need other providers who are available, or is it just a cultural thing, or hard to tease that out? Yeah, that's a great question. I think perhaps it's related to the fact that certified nurse midwives in this country, that certified nurse midwifery was born out of public health nursing, and that because of public health nursing and the importance of well woman care and contraception in public health, that was incorporated into nurse midwifery training. 
Interesting. That's just my guess. Interesting. So I wanted to get in a little bit with you about exactly how is it different being cared for by a midwife than maybe an obstetrician. I know if you know anyone looked at the two of us, they would just say, these two are the same person, right? Mm-hmm. There's nothing different about us at all in terms of anything. <laughs> but but um, right. you know, I think a lot of people in this country, a lot of women in this country really don't understand what the difference is and sort of they are cared for by a midwife or by a doctor just by happenstance. They don't make a necessarily a conscious choice one way or another. And I think it would be nice to maybe help people understand some of the differences so they could make a choice if they have an, op- an opportunity to. And so- yeah. How do midwives do things differently, maybe from how doctors would do it? That's a great question. And I think it has to do with the approach. Midwives approach pregnancy and birth. And believe me, Nady, there is absolutely no judgment in this, in my saying this. <laughs> no worries. Lay, lay it on. I'm ready. Um, you know, when when you go to medical school, you're, what you're trained in is to take care of sick people right? Um, medical school is, I don't know because I haven't been to medical school, but I imagine, you know, when you become, (laughs) when you become a doctor, you do it because you want to take care of sick people. And so the approach in obstetrics is a bit more focused on what could go wrong, how to prevent things from going wrong and how to treat them when they do. Midwives, We also learn, of course, how to look out for things going wrong and how to treat them when they do. But the approach is much more, I would say, holistic and focused on the pregnant person as a human being and the experience of pregnancy and birth as an experience. And so we are trained to support the natural process and to help women learn about the natural process and make it a safe and a really good experience for the entire family. That's our focus. You're right in the sense that, you know, all the testing that happens, all the um, the medical tests that we do, the screening, you and I do all the same things, right? We all we both screen our patients for gestational diabetes. We both screen our patients for infections. But I, because I take care mostly, because midwives in general take care mostly of women who are at low risk for medical complications, we have more of an opportunity to provide the woman an experience that allows the process to be more natural, I guess, and to allow it to happen without intervention. Right. And I think there's a lot of important things you said there, and I definitely want to unpack it. And one of the first things is, uh, this is something that you know, is, is obvious to, to you and to me, but maybe not to everyone out there is, you know, a lot of the things you were talking about, you know, someone would say about a doula, for example, who's a labor support person, but it's, mm-hmm. you know, midwifery is, is way different from a doula from being a support person because doulas are essentially, yeah, there's some training, but basically they're just there to, you know, support, to help, to, you know, make you feel better, put you in different positions, you know, maybe exactly. maybe give you a little bit of support, uh, you know, on, on nursing or whatever. But midwifery are trained, you know, medically, and you yes. are trained in terms of the complications and what to do and how to, you know, screen for them and look for them and recognize them. And so that when you're describing sort of that, you know, supportive, normal labor, normal process approach, that's not just being there to support, but it's also in the context of, you know, making sure everything is healthy and safe and what. So that's just, yeah, that's just an important thing to, you know, to That's a great point, Nadie. Yeah. Because I think people do get a a lot, there is a lot of confusion about the difference between midwives and doulas. And you've said it exactly right. Doulas are trained to support women through contractions, essentially, how to cope with the labor, with labor and contractions, but they are not trained in how to manage complications like postpartum hemorrhage or hypertension. And they're also not trained in in performing a delivery. Right. <laughs> they don't get in there. So while midwives do as much as possible to support the natural process, we are also ready to intervene when necessary. When there is a postpartum hemorrhage, we know what to do. When there is a shoulder dystocia, we know what to do. So it's almost the best of both worlds. Right. And I, and I do think another important point is, you know, you were describing a lot sort of the differences philosophically between midwifery and obstetrics, medical school, or whatever it is, so to speak. 
And I think there's definitely a, a different philosophy in terms of the approach that it comes from. Like you said, from midwifery, the assumption is we're going to support someone through a normal process. And from obstetrics, it's really how do we deal with when the process is abnormal or maybe right. needs to be pushed in a different direction. And that's philosophical. But the important thing is, you know, number one is in practice, you may not always notice a difference. For example, mm-hmm. if if you know if I'm taking care of someone on the labor floor and you're taking care of someone on the labor labor floor, you may not be able to pick out which one of us is a midwife or which one of us is a doctor unless someone just mm-hmm. assumed I wasn't a midwife because I'm a man, which isn't does not have to be true. But let's say they made right. that assumption. Other than that, you wouldn't necessarily know probably ninety percent of the time. And part of that is because in a ideal model, you and I learn from each other. Right. Mm -hmm. So, you know, in an ideal model, I am as an obstetrician and am able to sort of help support women through a normal process and not over medicalize it or not make it something, you know, very, quote unquote, you know, sterile and cold or this or that, but it would be, the you know, sort of the assumptions that doctors would do. And on the flip side, you know, you would be in an environment where you would have, you know, either uh, expertise in or you would have, you know, the ability to to talk with or speak to or get help from doctors in case something really bad did happen, you know, there was severe preeclampsia exactly. or whatever. And so in those models where we learn from each other, patients really can get the best of both worlds almost regardless of who they see. Yes. That's the collaborative care model. There's even a model at UCSF, the University of California at San Francisco. The midwives there are the ones who train the residents in normal birth. That That's what they're hired for. And that is their role. That's fantastic. Yeah. So it's a really, it's a wonderful way to collaborate. Right. I mean, I remember um, when I- we do sorry. some of that. I was going to say we do some of that when we work together at Mount Sinai. Um, there are often interns and medical students who ask to observe midwifery births so that they can see a difference in focus. Right. Absolutely. I remember when I was training and at the time, uh, Dr. Joanna Schulman, who was our residency yes. director, would always encourage the students and the residents to attend some of the midwife births. And she said, you're going to learn so much about normal birth from, mm-hmm. you know, being with one of the midwives. And you can learn that from being an op- with an obstetrician as well, but you may learn different ways to approach things, both, yeah. you know, physically or also just the way people speak to one another. I mean, just, you know, when people come at it from different angles, you're going to learn a lot of different things if you are diverse in your training. Absolutely. And she always encouraged us to do that. And it's interesting because there are definitely a lot of different models. Like you said, you know, at UCSF, the midwives are specifically there to train in normal delivery. I know at Mount Sinai, there is a separate midwifery service and a separate OB service, but really there's so much work together on the same yeah. group that it's almost hard to pick them apart one from another. And mm-hmm. in other places, they are very separate. And sometimes the midwives have their own area, like a birth center, for example, where it's really just them. Yes. And, yep. and there's a lot of different options. And so when people are considering, you know, whether to be cared for by a midwife or an obstetrician, it's not just the person's training or the letters after their name. It's also what kind of model are they in? What right. kind of system are they a part of? And that's something that I think a lot of people wouldn't understand. Yeah, that's a very good point. Where you give birth can have a huge effect on your experience. If it's in the hospital versus a childbearing center outside of the hospital versus at home. Um, And that makes a huge difference. There are a lot more options and a lot more ways to support the natural process if you're not in a hospital setting. Right. So, I mean, for example, someone said, I want to deliver with a midwife and I want to deliver in a bathtub. Mm-hmm. Okay, they they can't come to Sinai whether they have a midwife right. or not. They just don't have bathtubs, right? It doesn't exist. Exactly. And so it's it's not just the provider. And how would people figure that out? I mean, how would they even seek those opportunities out? Wow, that's a good question. Um I guess it's a matter of being having access to information. It's a matter of culture too. I mean, in in our culture, birth has become very medicalized and people assume that you have to go to the hospital to give birth. Not many people know that it's possible to give birth in a birthing center or that it's safe to give birth at home with a qualified midwife. My own sister (laughs) 
when she became pregnant, called me up and said, I'm so excited and I have an appointment with my OBGYN next week. And I said, why? <laughs> why, why? Why are you excited? Uh, why are you pregnant? Or why, are you an OB? Why, why are you seeing an OB? <laughs> in American culture, birth has become medicalized and hospital birth has become the norm. And so I, there really are the opportunities to give birth outside of the hospital are few and far between, unfortunately. I worked in a childbearing center outside of the hospital for five years before I came to Mount Sinai. It was an incredible experience, and it's one of the options, I think, that can truly benefit women because you have the best of both worlds. You have a home-like atmosphere that truly supports the natural process, but you have trained midwives with a good plan for transfer should that become necessary. Right, and I think that that's the one thing that gets lost in a lot of the discussions, sometimes debates, and sometimes arguments over this concept of either birth centers or home births and these ideas is it's way different if it's being done sort of rogue versus being done within a collaborative system. Exactly. And it's just, it's night and day. And so when people try to compare home births or birth center births in, in certain places, let's say the US versus you know, England, for example, it's Mm -hmm. really not a fair comparison because- You are absolutely right about that. You're so right about that. Midwives in the United Kingdom are fully integrated into the healthcare system and home birth is fully integrated into the healthcare system. So there is no rogue home birth. All midwives receive the same standardized training and have absolute access to emergency care should it be needed. Whereas here, home birth in some places is actually illegal and demonized. And so midwives who attend birth at home are discouraged from transferring when they need to be. And transfer can be a very difficult experience for both the woman the birthing woman and the midwife. And that definitely increases the risk. If it's not safe, it's, it's if it's perceived as not safe to give birth in the hospital, midwives and women are going to be less likely to go in time. It's a very difficult thing. I and mean, the data has been looked at all over the place. And mm-hmm. essentially what everyone agrees on or should agree on, because the data is very clear, is that for the vast majority of women, pretty much whatever they do, they will end up with a healthy mom, healthy baby with delivery. So that's whether they deliver in a hospital, a birth center, or at home. As long as Mm -hmm. there's someone taking care of them, they will do fine. And so because of that- As long as there's someone qualified to take care of them. Right. If there's someone taking care of them. And so because of that, there's this idea like, okay, if most people are going to do well, then they should- be able to deliver at home if that's what they prefer. Now, listen, some people mm-hmm. prefer not to deliver at home, which is fine too, but if that's what they yes. prefer, great. But the issue is there is a percentage of the time where it doesn't go well, which everyone knows about. It could be infection. It could be something concerning about the baby's heart rate, the labor isn't progressing properly. There's bleeding, mm-hmm. you know, whatever it might be, there's something that could go wrong. And the question is, okay, if you're in the hospital, anything you might need or any person you might need or any procedure you might need physically right there. Mm -hmm. If you're at a birth center, generally the birth centers are built physically to be next to, attached to, or nearby Mm -hmm. a hospital where they have those things. And okay, so maybe it's not in the exact same hallway, but it's just a wheelchair ride or a bed ride, you know, down the hall, up an elevator, and then you're there. With a home birth, it would involve calling an ambulance and being transported to a hospital. And if you're in a situation where that's not coordinated in advance. It's going to be an issue with time, right? Because it could be be an hour or two before that actually happens. And when when someone comes there, it's almost like reinventing the wheel. Who are you? Who is this? What's going on? Do we trust you? And then it becomes a whole mess. Whereas if it's a system where, okay, I'm going to labor at home, but if if there's a problem, I'm going to come and everyone's like, okay, we're ready for you. And it's 10 minutes, whatever then yeah, you wouldn't expect there to be any issues. It should go well. Right. And and we don't have that in the US. Or at least, at least nowhere that I know of reliably. I think maybe in the Northwest, there's a couple places that have a pretty good system, but really mm-hmm. basically no, certainly not in New York. And that's why it becomes so hard to, to encourage home births when we don't have that system set up. We really yeah. should be encouraging setting up a system 
and then it yes, can happen. Yes, exactly. A huge important part of this also is screening for home birth making sure that the woman does not have risk factors that would that would increase the risk of something bad happening at home. When I worked at the childbearing center, our screening was very, very rigorous, and we would not accept women for birth if they were anemic, for example, or mm-hmm. if they were diabetic, or if they had hypertension. None of those women were qualified to deliver outside of the hospital. Right, just because so many of them would end up needing to go back to the because hospital, it's not worth risk. it. Yeah, exactly, exactly. And when you're collaborating, when there's true collaboration between out of hospital midwifery and hospital birth, the outcomes are the same. The outcomes are exactly the same. You would expect them to be. I mean, that's that's what yeah. the, da- the data out of Europe shows that they're the same. And the data out of New York shows that they're not the same. And it's right. not because midwives are better there or doctors and midwives are worse hair or whatever it is. It's it's just they have a system set up. They're ready for this. And we're, right. we're, and we're, we're our not. Culture, our culture has not fostered that system. Our culture, the culture of obstetrics in this country has pretty much demonized midwifery. It's That's an extreme saying, but it's mm-hmm. true. We've put birth into the hospital and we've medicalized it to a point where home birth cannot be integrated into the system. I don't think it's impossible. I, I do think that it is possible, um, especially since it has been done so well in other countries. But it's going to take a lot of work and a lot of collaboration. Have you seen any changes in this over, let's say, the past 10, 15 years, either that idea of midwifery being demonized or put aside? Is that getting better? Is that getting worse? I have not really seen much of a change, to be honest with you. Um, And it is geographic. I I live and work in New York City. There are a lot of midwives here. Uh, There are actually a lot of home birth midwives in New York City that do a lot of very, very good work. But if you go outside of New York City, if you go to the Midwest, it's very much a hospital birth culture. And nurse midwives practice differently from the way that we practice. In what way? There, It is a lot more medical and a lot more nursing is a lot, a much bigger part of the midwifery culture. They function almost like obstetricians in a way. I mean, I would say more. Uh, they do also collaborate, but I, I could be wrong about this, but it, see, it, it, because midwifery is regulated by the states, mm-hmm. it really different. It, it differs between states. So, for example, in some states, midwives have prescriptive privileges and are much more autonomous. In other states, midwives do not have prescriptive privileges and are required to be, quote unquote, supervised by a, uh, by a physician. Right. When you say prescriptive privileges, you mean the ability to write prescriptions. Prescribe medications. Medications. Exactly. Well. So meaning they're considered yeah. sort of, you know, healthcare providers Independent versus. Independent providers. Exactly. Right. Got it. It's really fascinating because if you look at studies about births that are, you know, overseen by midwives or at least uh, intended to be overseen by midwives, obviously something could change if there's an issue and they need to do a C-section or whatnot. And it gets, mm-hmm. you know, sort of uh, handed off to, to an OBGYN. The outcomes are really good, if not better, than if mm-hmm. taken care of an obstetrician. There's a lot of data on that. And, you know, some of it is hard to interpret because in general, midwives are going to start out with lower risk women than right. obstetricians would. So it's hard sometimes to tease out, you know, when you see a study that says, oh, the midwives have a lower C-section rate. Well, it could be because indeed you're more, you know, tolerant of longer labors and, you know, let things progress naturally. And that would lead to lower C-section rate, which is for sure, you know, plausible. It's mm-hmm. also possible that maybe, you know, midwives sort of get women who are lower risk for C-sections to begin with. And that's part of it. And it could be combination, obviously. Mm-hmm. But certainly the data shows that, you know, being cared for by midwife is at least as good, if not better. It's not worse. That's yeah. for sure. Well, I think part of it also, you're absolutely right. Part of it is that we do start out with women who are at lower risk, but in many places we don't. Our practice here at Mount Sinai, we do care for women who have some underlying medical issues and our C-section rate is much lower than the doctors at Mount Sinai or than Mount Sinai's in general. Part of it, I believe also is that the use of interventions can sometimes, when they're not necessary, can create problems. For Mm -hmm. example, unnecessary inductions of labor. When a woman's body is not ready, 
can increase the risk of a woman's a woman needing a C-section or an operative delivery or um, you know the use of pitocin when it's not necessary can increase fetal the risk of fetal distress which can then need, it's basically what we call a, the domino effect a cascade of interventions mm-hmm. you start with one intervention and you need more and more interventions and if you leave most women alone they will do well and i think that's where our focus is is really avoiding interventions unless they're necessary 